Your Excellencies, dear partners of Utopia and VUB, dear fellow Utopia rectors, beste Belgische rectoren, ook beste directeur, dear students, colleagues and friends. Today, academia takes over politics. The hemicycle here resembles an auditorium, and that's maybe why we feel right at home here. Unfortunately, we cannot vote on important issues because the services of the parliament were smart enough to turn off the voting machines. If we cannot vote, we must agree. And we have to agree on important issues. And I do think you all agree that it's great to be here today. We are grateful to the hospitality of the European Parliament, its president, Roberta Metzola, and for the support of two members of European Parliament, Hilde Veldmans and Kathleen van Brent. <laughs> and I guess we all agree that the opening of an academic year together with 10 universities is quite symbolic. Founding father of the European Union, Jean Monnet said, Nous ne coalisons pas des États, nous unissons des hommes. And that's what we are doing with Utopia. We are not just connecting universities. We are uniting students, researchers, scientists. And the same Jean Monnet said, Rien n'est possible sans les hommes, mais rien n'est durable sans les institutions. And therefore, in a few minutes, we will sign a document with the 10 rectors that will give Utopia a legal basis and make it an institution. So, Utopia is here to stay, here and is here to stay across Europe and also beyond, and also. And I totally agree with fellow rector Tiziana Lipiello. The genesis of the Euro Utopia Alliance lies in our enduring belief in a unified European identity. So we all agree on the importance of the European di dimension. We agree on the added value of utopia. But I think we also agree on another issue, that we are living in times that are troubled, confusing, and challenging, that we are living a world in transition. My answer is that we need a new renaissance. In the following, I will use the more international pronunciation, renaissance. I'm not sure. We all agree on that, but I will try to convince you, convince you of the need that we have today for a new renaissance. And I'm occasionally approached by colleagues who wonder what these European networks are actually for and what Utopia is for. What is its purpose? Why are we putting time and energy in it? My short answer is that Utopia lives up to a dream, the dream of Jean Monnet. A slightly more detailed answers involves delving into history, more specifically to the time of the Renaissance, to explain how utopia can be part of a new Renaissance. The Renaissance was driven by three elements, curiosity, openness, and connectivity. Think Da Vinci, think Vesalius, think Erasmus. Together those three elements, curiosity, openness, and connectivity, led Europe into a new way of thinking turning diversity into an engine for the individual, intellectual, and societal mobility and growth. First and foremost, curiosity. The Renaissance was triggered by an enormous drive for new knowledge in philosophical, scientific, and the medical fields, and of course also in the arts. It is this curiosity, for example, that made translators move to Spain to translate hundreds of books from Arabic into Latin, or to Constantinople to translate books from Greek. And such ancient knowledge and new insights came together in European universities and created a kind of electroshock that shook Europe away out of the Middle Ages. The second element was openness. Those new insights from other civilizations could only flourish in places where there was a fertile ground, where there was openness to new and, yes, often heretic ideas. This opinion hérétique, Ketterse, Ideen. Fertile ground, fertile ground was certainly not found everywhere through the, the whole of Europe. It was mainly in those regions where the Inquisition had less to say that scientific project, pro, uh, progress was made. 
Firenze, Bologna, Padua, but also Saxony with Luther. And yes, even in Brussels where Erasmus spent half a year in 1521. So only where thought was free, where free inquiry was possible, could new ideas flourish and could the Renaissance come about. The third condition for the Renaissance was connectivity. Thinkers, philosophers, writers, philosophers, Erasmus and Thomas More traveled from England across Belgium to France and Italy. France. Contrary to popular belief, the group of Renaissance thinkers was relatively small and they knew each other quite well. They saw each other and debated new ideas and the social and political questions of the time. It's from such discussions that books like Utopia emerged and Dear Friends from Utopia to Utopia, it's only a small step. And at that time, there was also a revolutionary innovation that changed everything, the invention of the printing press. As a result, new ideas spread much faster than before. And perhaps we are witnessing something similar today with, as one of the previous speakers, with the birth of AI and ChatGPT. But let's move on. Two centuries after the Renaissance, the Enlightenment took place. Exactly the same conditions as during the Renaissance were present. Enlightenment thinkers looked with fascination beyond European walls and looked for knowledge in ancient Egypt, China, India, and in numerous other exotic places. That curiosity about the world was essential to our European enlightenment. And the same goes for openness. The enlightenment came about only in those regions and countries that were tolerant about new ideas. And while the Renaissance mainly started in the south of Europe, the Enlightenment emerged mainly in the north of Europe. Les Lumières, the Aufklärung. Connectivity was also required. Enlightenment thinkers went to live in places where they could express their ideas. Descartes and Spinoza lived close to each other. Thinkers discussed, books were exchanged. And without that connectivity, the Enlightenment would not have been the European upheaval that changed thinking across an entire continent and eventually the world. Connectivity, openness, curiosity, it all started with the Renaissance. Well, dear students, colleagues and friends, that is exactly what we need to achieve today with our universities, with all our European partners, with Utopia. A new Renaissance in Europe, because that is exactly what new, uh, Europe needs. We see polarization and populist forces emerging everywhere. Forces that question democracy, dismiss the emancipation of the individual, and ridicule science and scientists. Forces that subordinate universal human rights to their own tribal group ideas. No curiosity, no openness, no connectivity. Those forces are gaining ground, not only in Europe, but also around the globe. The rise of such closed and tribal thinking goes hand in hand with the building of walls. And walls go hand in hand with trenches. It is therefore urgent and necessary to formulate, to formulate new ideas and arrive at new insights. And it is precisely by building new academic networks and rethinking the role of universities that we can arrive at a new renaissance. We need a renewed curiosity and ways to challenge and to transcend boundaries. We must make more efforts to understand and learn from other cultures without prejudice. Let's build bridges to the east and to the south. Let's build bridges instead of walls and instead of trenches. We must not only defend our openness and tolerance, but also increase them. The polarization emerging all over the world pushes people too easily into one corner or another, into one camp or the opposite. Openness also means listening to opinions with which we largely disagree. And as my predecessor, the late Caroline Powell, used to say, always listen very carefully. Maybe the other is right. And we need to reinvest in connectivity to address our society's complex problems. The challenges that we face go beyond nations, languages and cultures. To address them, we need to bring together nations, languages and cultures. So we are lucky to have Utopia. 
Every Utopia member, every student, every researcher and staff member is at the same time in Brussels, Paris, Barcelona, Dresden, Gothenburg, Lisbon, Cluj-Napoca, Ven Cluj Venice, Coventry for the University of Warwick. There is no Brexit in Utopia. And isn't it telling that only three years after Brexit, the EU and the United Kingdom very recently reached an agreement on the UK's participation in Horizon Europe, the EU's research and innovation program. The British are back in Horizon Europe and at Utopia, they never left. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just give you two examples of how you, our Utopia network can and will play a part in this new renaissance. One is multilingualism and the second is science diplomacy. First of all, multilingualism, and I welcome the Brussels Minister of Multilingualism. Few people will disagree with the fact that understanding, speaking and writing several languages is an important asset for all of us, for every citizen. Multilingualism is all about curiosity, openness, and connectivity. It's also about embracing diversity and learning from others. Thinking in different languages is dealing with this topic from different angles in a kaleidoscopic world. If we want to learn from other cultures, and from other cultures, chance, and in the Enlightenment, multilingualism is essential. Unfortunately, today we are facing obstacles. Universities are under increasing pressure from conflicting policy agendas. On the one hand, universities are supposed to produce highly skilled and competent knowledge workers for a global economy with English as the language of international communication. On the other hand, universities are often perceived as national or regional flagships, where teaching in the national or regional languages is seen as an essential part of our identity. As a result, the educational language has become an ideological battleground. This is also the case in Flanders, the Dutch-speaking part of Belgium. We, as partner universities of Utopia, believe that this battle between English and other languages is the wrong battle that leads us to battle. That's why we want to approach, to propose a different approach. An approach with multilingualism at its heart in what we call the nurturing of an inclusive linguistic ecosystem. An ecosystem that provides opportunities for speakers of different languages to use their own linguistic resources in the process of their learning. By the way, a couple of weeks ago, the Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez asked Patrias, as co-official languages, as they are called, Catalan, Basque, and Galician become official languages. It's another step, once again, towards more multilingualism. Es un pas mes kep a mes multilinguisme. I pot ser no estic segur. Es la primera vegada que es parla català en aquest parlament des d'aquesta posició. I espero que no siga l'última vegada. For those... <laughs> For those not speaking Catalan, I just said that it's maybe the first time. I'm not sure that Catalan is spoken from this stage, and I hope that's not the last time. In the region bruxelloise where I live, it is normal to speak plusieurs languages at home. The majority of the young Bruxellois grow up in a multi family. Speaking various languages in the house is also what we do in our house, in our family. And we are not an exception, it's the case of the majority of the families in Bruxelles. Brussels is one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world, and we definitely should do more with the richness and the diversity here. All the living languages, all the living cities form a linguistic ecosystem whose power can and must be unlocked. Multilingualism is not a problem, certainly not in higher education. It's an opportunity. One of our partner universities, the Babes Bolya University in Cluj-Napoca in Romania, has academic programs in more than four languages, Romanian, Hungarian, and German, because they are the historically spoken languages in Transylvania, and now, of course, also English. 
If this is happening at the Babesh Bolya University, it's happening in Utopia. We are experimenting with multilingual pedagogies in a scientific way. We need to take down the barriers to multilingual participation in European education, training, and mobility. And we need to walk our talk. It's through multilingualism and through the connected communities of Utopia that we will be able to learn from others with, from a deeper level. With a multilingual approach, we can unlock new ideas, new concepts, and new visions, and of course, a new renaissance. Ladies and gentlemen, let me go deeper now in the second tool that Utopia has to help create the new renaissance, and that is science diplomacy. There are several dynamics that are profoundly changing the relationship between science and society. There are changes in how science is carried out. For example, the openness of data and the idea in general of open science. There are also changes in societal expectations and demands from society. For instance, regarding climate change and its solutions. At the same time, there is a growing distrust in science and scientists and there are limitations to scientific collaboration, sometimes imposed by governments. Today we are facing big challenges related to a world in transition. There is the Anthropocene with climate change. There is the abrupt digitalization of society, AI. There, is the, there are geopolitical tensions. These developments not only impact the way we function as universities, but they also force us to rethink our values and to rethink our place in society. The global, the planetary nature of the problems that we are facing implies a major transition in the relationship between science and society. States cannot continue to use science and science policy merely, merely to advance national interests and priorities, let alone regional interest. Today, there is a growing awareness that science has to serve global interest and humanity as a whole, planetary well-being. In this context of the growing entanglement of science and foreign affairs, it is in this context that science diplomacy is becoming more and more important. It's a kind of dialogue between two different worlds, the world of science and the world of diplomacy. And it consists of three principles. First of all, science in diplomacy. It's about scientific advice to the foreign policy community. Secondly, diplomacy for science. Here we are talking about joint governmental initiatives to facilitate international collaboration. Good examples are the Human Genome Project, CERN in Geneva, or as we saw in the movie Oppenheimer, the International Atomic Energy Agency. And the third principle is science for diplomacy. This is about maintaining research collaboration between states, even if they are in a conflict. And I'm sure that Federica, Federica Mogherini, as former high representative of the European Union for foreign affairs and security policy, has strong views on the roles of science in diplomacy. And we all look forward to your speech, Mrs. Mogherini. The idea of science diplomacy is now taking off in Europe, and I'm proud to announce here in the premises of the European Parliament that Utopia has a work package on science diplomacy. We will not only give science diplomacy a firm academic grounding, but also make sure that each and every scientist in our alliance can act on a daily basis as a diplomat for science, as an ambassador for science. The world needs more scientific knowledge and collaboration to face the global challenges, and that's exactly one of the major aims of our Utopia Alliance. It's not a utopia, it's a reality. Dear students, colleagues, and partners, I hope that it's now clear to everybody why we are putting so much time, energy, and effort into this Utopia European University. Utopia is all about the values that we are, that are so needed today, curiosity, openness, and connectivity. Utopia encourages each of us to start working on a new renaissance in Europe connected to the East and to the South. Utopia wants to play its role in a new era of global cooperation and scientific progress and aims to make our world a better place for everybody. 
That's exactly what the new renaissance is about. And as our students said, utopia is not an utopia, it's now a reality. Thank you very much for your attention.